get going again. Cool. Hello. Right. Now the, uh, the headline act of the evening. The man, to be honest, needs no introduction, but I'll give him a very quick one. It is Mitchell Hashimoto, of course, co-founder of HashiCorp. He's going to be talking about Nomad. So please give me a big round of applause for Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, cool. So yeah, I'm going to talk about one of our newer things, uh, Nomad. So I got an introduction, so I could just skip on over this. Um, I don't think I need to introduce what HashiCorp is at this meetup. Um, um, we do have nine tools, so I know there are a lot of people even at these meetups that use a few of them, use one of them, or, or however many, but don't realize there's a lot more. So um, ranging from sort of development tools and Vagrant to um, ops or DevOps with Terraform and things that we heard from today, console, um, to full on you know, security, uh, security engineer with, with Vault, uh, which, which we heard a little bit about. Uh, take a look at all of them. Um, feel free to ask me about any of them. And there's also six, including me, so five others, uh, HashiCorp employees here today, um, which is, which is kind of crazy because we we're all US based. So there's actually six of us here right now. Um, and they're going to Amsterdam after this to do a, a user group there. And uh, speaking of Amsterdam, we have uh, our conference. We're doing a, our first European conference in Amsterdam this year in June. So if you'd like to register, please go to hashiconf.eu. Um, but also, I think the call for proposals is still open till Friday. So if you have a talk idea, if you use our tools, um, then uh, please submit a talk, and, and maybe we'll hear from you. So uh, let's go ahead and get started and, and talk about Nomad. So, like I said, Nomad is one of our uh, newer tools or, or uh, projects that came out uh, at our US conference last year, which was in, I think, in September. So it's relatively new, relatively young, um, the youngest compared to the rest. And what Nomad is, is a distributed, optimistically concurrent scheduler. And we're going to cover what all those words mean um, and, and why they're important. But let's start from the bottom, uh, and that it's a scheduler. Let's just talk about schedulers real quick. So a scheduler, in, in an abstract, generic sense, is, is a well-defined thing. It's, it's something that maps a set of work to a set of resources. And usually, the set of work is greater than the number of resources, and that therein lies sort of the challenge with a scheduler. So uh, we, we are surrounded by schedulers every single day. We've been surrounded by schedulers uh, for decades. So to give you a few examples, um, in all of your laptops, there's a CPU scheduler. The, the point of the CPU scheduler, like any scheduler, is to map work to resources. The work in this case is applications. The resources are CPU cores um, and, and time slots on those CPU cores. So um, this is what a CPU does day in, day out. That's all it does. And um, yeah, it, you could also do stuff like pinning things to CPUs. I mean, the, the, the idea of a scheduler is that it could uh, it, the way that it maps things is up to it, and it's abstracted away from uh, the input. In addition to CPU schedulers, there's a lot of other different kinds of schedulers that we probably interact with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, EC2 is, in fact, a scheduler. It is a very good uh, virtual machine scheduler. So it's using, um, you know, it's using a hypervisor, uh, Zen underneath, but Above that, the, the real thing that they've built is a scheduler so that when you say, I want a VM, you don't choose where that VM is usually. It just gives it to you where it finds space, and it packs the space into a server with a bunch of other customers to try to save itself money. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a virtual machine scheduler. There's also things like Yarn, which schedules MapReduce jobs, uh, a cluster scheduler, which schedules applications. Um, cluster schedulers, uh, and this is, as a hint, this is what Nomad is, but um, cluster schedulers historically have primarily been uh, in academia. They've been data science sort of things. You, sh you run huge uh, data science jobs on clusters, and, and that's really where cluster schedulers came from over the past uh, many decades. Um, and then finally, there's human schedulers, which are you know, yourself or an executive assistant or what have you, and you know, they're, they're mapping uh, a set of meetings onto a very limited set of calendar time slots. So, all these things are a form of scheduling. So the advantages of a scheduler, why you want a scheduler, um, is you get higher resource utilization. Uh, you get to decouple uh, your work from your resources. You don't have to think about the resources so much anymore. Um, and you get better quality of service. And, and in more detail for each one, 
Uh, you're able to get higher resource utilization because uh, you get bin packing. So that's um, the process of uh, trying to use a set of space as efficiently as possible. You know, we, uh, a scheduler's job is to try to uh, fit the, the boxes into a bigger box as efficiently as possible. It's kind of like Tetris. Um, you get oversubscription, so you're able to do things like, I know there's only 100% uh, of CPU available on the box. I just schedule 120% because we're probably not going to run at full capacity anyway. So you could oversubscribe uh, a machine. And, and a lot of you know, shared hosting providers do this, for example. Like your shared host usually isn't very active, so they'll just slam a bunch of customers onto a single machine, even though if all of them were active, the machine could not keep up with it at all. Uh, and then there's job queuing, which is the uh, idea of even with oversubscription, if you submit a job and there just isn't any space for it, queuing means to just hold it and, and make it pending until there is space. And when there is space, schedule it. So all of these things lead to higher resource utilization. Uh, for decoupling work from resources, I think this is fairly straightforward, but, but schedulers are an abstraction, and abstractions make us more efficient. That's, that's why they exist. And the abstraction here is being able to just focus on applications and not how exactly they're getting deployed. Um, and that's, that's pretty much that. And then for quality of service, you get things like priorities, um, resource isolation, and preemption. So these are all sort of related. Priorities and preemption in particular are fairly related. Um, and that's the idea that you have jobs that aren't as important. You know, the, to send the activation email isn't as important as potentially processing uh, a new customer's credit card so they can start using uh, your SaaS or what have you. So you're able to assign priorities to jobs. And, uh, and the scheduler's job is to make sure that this runs ahead of this thing. Um, and CPUs also do this. You know, your kernel um, can never get preempted. Obviously, it's the scheduler. But there's certain applications that can never just be, be uh, forced out. And, and all of this, uh, I'm talking in, the, in, in a generic scheduler sense, but, but Nomad supports these. And, and so schedulers aren't new at all. Um, I, I've mentioned that a few times. There, schedulers in various forms have existed for a long time. But even cluster schedulers, which is what Nomad is, have existed for quite a long time. And so all four of these companies up here have been using a form of cluster scheduler uh, for over a decade. Um, not Twitter, but Google for over a de decade. Uh, Netflix for probably about a decade. Uh, AWS since it launched, um, which is about a decade. And, and Twitter uh, since, since they launched, which actually is a decade. So yeah, they're all 10 years. Um, they all happen to be 10 years. But um, these folks really pioneered uh, cluster schedulers, which is really bringing the academic notion of a scheduler or, um, uh, the, or that, that view of a scheduler and bringing it to really the industri industrial, like commercial world of how these could apply to everyday applications in a, in a tech world. And so these are very, very technical companies. Um, they, they live on the bleeding edge. They, they create the bleeding edge, more or less. And you know, we're finally getting to the point, 10 years later, where that's, that's trickling downwards. And schedulers are now very readily available for the masses. <laughs> and so that's, those are schedulers in, in, in the abstract. Now let's talk more specifically about Nomad. So Nomad, like I said, it is a cluster scheduler. And the whole point of a cluster scheduler is to very easily deploy applications. Um, and to enable you to very easily deploy applications, uh, Nomad defines what we call a job specification. And we're, again, going to start from the bottom. We're going to look at the job specification and then talk about uh, all the other features of Nomad uh, through it. So here's a job specification, uh, an example one. Uh, this is valid. Um, it's, it, the, the syntax will look very similar, uh, familiar to you if you've used our other tools. Uh, this is the syntax we use for all our tools. Um, and what we're defining here is a job. So this job is named Redis. Um, we're telling it to run in the US East Data Center. Uh, it has one task, which, which is also Redis. And it's going to run using Docker and this Redis image. And then we describe at the bottom the resources that we need for it to run. Um, so in this case, some CPU, some memory, um, some guarantee, or, or we're asking for a certain amount of uh, bandwidth on the, on the network device. And then we want a port, which we're not specifying. We're just asking the scheduler to please allocate a port for us. We need a port. Um, and we'll go through most of these features, I think, a little bit later. But you can see how this is a very human-readable, easy thing to do. And the whole point of the job specification is that we do want the, the developers to actually be writing this. If you're building a server, a service, 
as a developer, you're the one also writing the job specification. So we want to make it as easy as possible for a developer to do something that feels a little operational. Um, but that's, that's it. After they write this, then they run it, and it's, and it's gone and running. So the job specification declares what to run. Um, this, you'll see this also is a common trend among HashiCorp tools. We're big believers in declarative configurations. So it doesn't, it doesn't say uh, where or how to run it. And that's, that's the job of our tool, Nomad. So the job, the job specification says, this is what I want. And then it's Nomad's job to make that happen in some way. And, and in this case, in a scheduler's case, that means which server do I run it on, which server has space for this, and how do I launch it? How, do, how does it actually get? run. <clears throat> so it's a super powerful concept, the idea of abstracting any sort of application deployment uh, away. And yet, you could see that it, it could be relatively simple. Um, I, don't, I don't know why I have this here again, so I'll let it go. <clears throat> um, so one of the, uh, I'll mention though, one of the, one of the most powerful features of Nomad, which is still unique to Nomad uh, today, is this idea of a driver. So if you look at task Redis right there, underneath it says driver equals Docker. Um, this is a really important feature, I think, um, aligns very well with sort of how we view the world. But uh, drivers allow Nomad to schedule different types of workloads um, together. So um, built out of the box with, uh, with Nomad today, uh, we have the Docker driver, which allows you to run containerized workloads. We have a QMU KVM driver, which allows you to run virtualized workloads. And then we also have drivers just for launching jars and static binaries uh, on their own. Uh, and that's, that's a separate driver. Because if you have jars or static binaries, they're effectively containers already. They have almost everything, or they do have everything they need um, in there. So why rewrap it? Um, if you run one of those, then Nomad will go ahead and use LXC directly. It, won't, it doesn't need Docker. It'll just use LXC. It'll use C groups. It'll use all the same isolation and wrap those up for you and run them. Um, but it is a driver model. This is an interface that we can plug into. So there's a lot more coming. And in the containerized world, we have things like Jetpack. Um, actually, I think we already have support for Rocket, so I should have mentioned Rockets on there. But um, Jetpack for FreeBSD, uh, Windows Server containers for the, the new Windows servers coming out this year. Um, in the virtualization space, we, we could add support for Zen, uh, Hyper-V. And then for standalone, we want to support CLR applications, which again are, are pretty much uh, standalone containers already. Um, and Windows in particular has a lot of really nice uh, built-ins to the operating system for isolation. Like uh, containers are coming, but in a lot of ways, they didn't make sense in the Windows world because it has so many useful isolation primitives. They're just not easy to use. So all sorts of things are coming. <laughs> But the whole point is that Nomad will figure that out for you. You, know, you give it the CLR application and how we're creating you know, a new Windows user and an isolated process space and all that sort of stuff using the Windows APIs is not your problem. So feature-wise of Nomad, there's quite a, quite a lot, but these are sort of the high-level ones. Um, application deployment, um, we put Docker as a first-class thing because it really makes productionizing Docker a lot easier. Um, which is, seems to be a problem. I was at QCon today and seems to be a problem. Um, it supports multi-data center and multi-region out of the box. So um, this is also another unique feature of Nomad compared to any other scheduler, um, is the idea that we could separate regions, such as if we're using AWS as, as an example, you could separate US East from US East 1A, 1B, 1C at the scheduler level. Um, so that lets you say this job should run in both the East and West Coast data centers, or this job should be um, only in the East Coast across two uh, availability zones, basically. And that's built into Nomad itself, whereas uh, other schedulers, uh, such as Mesos or something, sort of leave it as an exercise to the operator, um, which, which could be frustrating. Um, flexible workloads is what we call the driver model. Um, the most interesting thing about the driver model is not that you could run heterogeneous workloads. That, that's sort of obvious, but the fact that actually Nomad uh, will run heterogeneous workloads on the same machine, which, which when you think about it is obvious, but sometimes needs to be pointed out. So if you have, if you have one very large VM and, and 10 containers, and one machine has the ability to fit all those, then the Nomad scheduler will actually put the VM, 10 containers, and maybe the standalone things all on the same machine, and will bin pack those heterogeneous environments for you. Um, so this is super important for uh, migrating. Um, again, a big, a big topic at QCon today was actually like, how do we adopt containers into production. Like we, we have a fully virtualized workload. How do we get there? And it can't happen in one atomic 
switch. You can't just one day turn off all the VMs and turn on all the containers, and you never had both. And so when you're having both, how do you make that work? And, and Nomad lets you do that a lot easier because you could start by just scheduling all your VMs using Nomad, and then you could move on to just starting to schedule containers and replace services. Um, bin packing, that's sort of an obvious feature of schedulers. It'll optimize the space for you as well as it can. And then the HCL job specification, which, which is also unique to Nomad. Um, other schedulers have much more complicated or non-developer friendly uh, ways to define applications. So besides specific features, at a high level when we built Nomad, we had three goals in mind. Um, we wanted it to be easy for developers, we wanted it to be operationally simple, and we wanted it to work uh, at a very, very large scale. So these were the three goals we had, and when we looked at when we looked at the other schedulers in the space, because we're certainly the most recent one in a space that already has a handful, um, the reason we even built Nomad to begin with was because we felt that we could do much better in these three categories and that, um, that it was important to do much better because uh, adopting the other ones we saw was just difficult. And even for us, it was difficult to get running, which uh, usually isn't a good sign since we do ops all the time. So going through each of these, how did we make Nomad easy for developers? Uh, so there's three major ways we did that. The, it's a very simple data model. Um, understanding what the, the vocabulary of Nomad is very, very simple. There's, there's jobs, there's task groups, and there's tasks, and that's effectively at drivers, you kind of got to know. Um, it's the declarative job specification, so you don't need to uh, go into how things get running. You just say what you want and leave it to the operator, which is a much easier uh, mindset for developers to live in. And then there's a bunch of sane defaults. So I showed you the full job spec earlier with a lot of details, but actually a lot of the stuff in there is, uh, is optional. So like you don't need to specify data centers or anything like that, because we'll just default to um, all of them, basically, in the, in the default region. Um, you don't need to specify a lot of the uh, resources configurations. We could just assume that it'll fit. Um, you know, over time, you want to specify these things. But if you're just getting started, then there's a lot of same defaults to just send it out there. Uh, going through in more detail a lot of the features and showing how it looks in a job specification, this is just going to be a whirlwind sort of uh, tour through some of the features that Nomad gives you. Um, so we give you rolling updates. Um, so this says, uh, for the foobar job, stagger uh, all the updates, separate them by 60 seconds, and do three at a time. So if you have 12, this will take uh, four minutes to deploy this out. And that lets you slowly roll out services, um, do drains, and things like that. Uh, counts are built in. So if you actually want to scale a service up and down, and it's the identical job, you could just increase the counts. So you could say actually run three instances of the API service, or five instances, or however you many you need to handle the load you're getting. Uh, so scale up, scale down is just changing a count and rerunning. And since it is declarative, you don't need to tell Nomad what changed. You just send it the whole job file again. And it does the diff on its own. It's like, oh, you, you only change the count, so that's what's going to happen right now. Um, Nomad doesn't currently have the concept of a plan like Terraform, but that's, that's sort of something that's coming as well. So the idea of, like, I have this job file. Please tell me what you would do if I were to run this, what, what is changing. That's coming. But for now, you just sort of have to run it. Uh, there's constraints. So uh, there. There's this distinct host constraint, which means that never run more than one on the same node. Um, that's pretty nice if you're trying to horizontally scale a web service. If you ask for five and all five go on the same server, it usually doesn't get the effect you desired. So this lets you say, I want five, and I want them on five different machines. Um, I don't know if I have a slide that shows it, but there's also, there's also arbitrary constraints. So you could specify arbitrary key value uh, metadata on a client and actually do constraints on it. So you could say, uh, run it on the machine that's in a public subnet, and you could tag that machine as in a, being in a public subnet, and Nomad will constrain it to the right places for you. <clears throat> There's restart policies, so if a job fails to start, um, it tells Nomad whether it should just fail the job completely or if it should try to start it again for a while. Um, these are pretty simple, uh, familiar. You know, how many times should I try to restart it? How long should I wait between uh, trying to restart it? Uh, and how long should I delay sort of between the restarts? So um, this, is, this is really useful in building uh, uh, an infrastructure with Nomad where you could launch everything at the same time 
and perhaps they fail because the application will crash if the database isn't running or something. This lets it sort of just restart until hopefully the database is running so it all sort of fits together. Um, ideally, your application deals with that, but this lets you deal with more brownfield sort of things that may not be that well architected. Oh, I do have this. So yeah, you could do constraints on, on things. Um, so there's a lot of metadata built into Nomad. There's, you could do arbitrary metadata, but we'll, we'll expose things like kernel versions, um, CIDR blocks. Uh, if you're in AWS, we also expose AZs and things like that. that we, we expose a bunch of defaults, but you could also do arbitrary stuff. And you can see that it's not just equivalence uh, comparisons. You could actually do, uh, this is actually a semantic version comparison. So it's actually more clever than just like a string comparison. It's actually splitting versions for you. Um, but you could do pretty clever things with this. Uh, you can inject environmental variables into the job. I think that's straightforward. Uh, and service discovery is built in. So right now it's only with console, but uh, you can specify a service block, and this will actually uh, register that job with service discovery automatically when it gets up and running. So in this case, uh, it registers it. We don't need to specify name or port or anything. Uh, well, we specify port a little bit, but we don't need to specify a number. We're basically, the name will come from the task, so it'll be the my app um, service. The port is saying, we didn't ask for a specific, specific port, so this is saying whatever Nomad allocated for the HTTP named port, make that the port that we advertise to console. Um, and then you could also specify health checks that, that happen with this thing. Uh, and then there's, there's different types of schedulers that, that Nomad has. And when I was first learning about schedulers, the idea of different types of schedulers in a scheduler was really hard to wrap my mind around. Um, but the basic idea is, is the way that the algorithm that Nomad will use to determine where to put your job. So if you think of schedulers in the abstract as a set of work going to a set of resources, um, if you're a developer, then that's basically a function. Like a, a scheduler is a function that takes a set of work and then returns the set of places that that thing should run. And you could change that function to change the behavior. And so type is actually the function to use to map the work to resources. Um, and there's, there's a bunch, and I, I hopefully go through them uh, in this slide a little bit later. But in this case, a system type is a scheduler that for each or, uh, each piece of work will map it to every resource. So it doesn't matter what count you say, for every, this one will run on every machine. So you can imagine logging agents, um, console agents, those sorts of things, that's a system job. So you don't need to specify count equals the count of your infrastructure distinct host, host equals true, which would be a weird workaround around that. You could just say type equals system, and as you add or remove uh, nomad nodes, that job will always get scheduled uh, onto it. And priority equals 100. Um, I don't know what the default priority is. I, I can't remember. I think it's something like 50. But if you specify priority equals 100, that's the max it could be. And that basically means that if this can't fit on the machine, we specified its system. It should run on everything. If it can't fit on the machine, evict something with a lower priority and, and run this thing. So priority equals 100 basically forces this to run. And then sort of the last thing um, which was really important to us was having this simple dev flag. So if you run Nomad Agent with a dev flag, it runs, it's both a server and a client all in memory on your machine. So it was important to be able to really quickly run the scheduler so that developers could test their job files or their job specifications. And so you could actually run Nomad Agent Dev and have zero configuration at all. And this will run everything in memory, zero state. When you control C this, everything dies. There's nothing left over uh, unless you just run your job files uh, locally. So in this case, you could see uh, down here that this is available to, to run Docker and exec drivers. So it detected the ability to run those. Uh, and you, you could actually test it in this case. Cool. So sort of as an overview, um, Nomad is infrastructure's code, as declarative jobs. Um, it's all desired state um, oriented. Um, and it gives you sort of the emergent state using an API. So you could then use an API to ask for where are the things actually right now. Um, and this is sort of how we tried to make it uh, friendly for developers. So then the next thing was making it operationally simple. And I think this is actually one slide. And the, the way we did this is we looked, at, we looked at all the other schedulers out there. And a scheduler on its own is a distributed system. And it looked like all the other schedulers required more distributed systems to run their distributed system. So you needed things like Zookeeper or etcd or something in addition. And, and knowing how to operate one distributed system is hard enough. And knowing how to operate 
multiple that are architected totally differently is, is a lot to ask just to deploy something that deploys other things. Um, so with Nomad, um, we, we, we pondered early on of making you know, console a requirement. There's a good reason why uh, these other schedulers require Zookeeper etcd. You need that sort of distributed consensus-based state store. So we we're like, well, let's make console uh, required. But, but we wanted to make Nomad easier to run. So what we did with Nomad was we made it all one binary. So um, if you're familiar with how consoles are architected, we did something very similar with Nomad. So console actually embeds surf um, to make things easier. Nomad actually embeds console. Um, so we, ac we, we, we wrote console, so we know how to do that. So Nomad actually contains console, doesn't expose console's features. We only use it for local state store, leader election, any of that. So we didn't have to reinvent um, any of that. So Nomad is a single binary. If you download Nomad and unzip it, it's one statically compiled binary. And depending on the command line flags you give it, it either acts as a client which runs work or acts as a server which schedules work. Um, or in the case of the dev mode only, it's actually both. And then the last thing is, is you know, developers, uh, developer experience good, operationally simple. The last thing was actually making it work, uh, building it for scale. And, and this was important and also kind of stressful for us because we were sort of the last scheduler in the game. So we didn't have a lot of time to mature Nomad um, to make it work at scale. So we really needed it to work out of the box, and that's not... That's, that's stressful. So the way we were able to do this was by building on the experience and on the shoulders of the other things that we've built that have been proven at huge scale. So like I said, Nomad uh, embeds console. It also embeds surf for other things. And both of these tools um, have been used at really, really, really large scale. So um, surf has single data centers that are in the tens of thousands of nodes um, without any issue. Um, Console's been running on some infrastructures with um, dozens of different data centers, each running thousands of nodes without issue. So both of these are sort of proven foundations that we didn't need to reinvent. We didn't need to rewrite that code or retest that code. You know, that we didn't need to rewrite uh, leader election. We just embedded console, which knows how to do leader election, um, and that comes into Nomad. Uh, but of course, you know, consensus plus gossip does not make a scheduler. Um, so we also had to pull in some new stuff. Um, but instead of inventing that on our own, uh, we, we're, we're based in the Bay Area, so Amp Labs across the Bay, and uh, Google publishes all their papers. And we took a look at sort of all the research that we could find that's within the past uh, couple decades of how schedulers are built, um, and made some uh, import, important decisions of how we would architect our scheduler, which are different than any other scheduler out there. So a lot of it's the same. I mean, every scheduler will claim and, and is not lying that they're based on Borg or Omega or um, Sparrow or something like that. That's not a lie, um, but there are choices, architectural choices you can make in each of those implementations, and they're not toggleable. Like it's not a switch. You have to really build it in. And and the major design choice we made with Nomad, which is different from any other scheduler that's publicly available, um, is that Nomad's optimistically concurrent, and that's an important distinction, which uh, I'll mention uh, shortly. But this is what I. It's a decision we made that I think will give Nomad an edge in the same way that uh, a couple of years ago we bet on gossip protocols as being able to give us an edge in service discovery, and I believe it has. So we'll get to that. So okay, the next three or four slides are the most dense, roughest slides in this whole talk. Um, so if you care, then you should really pay attention for the next four slides because uh, I'm, I'm not going to go very slow through them. And if you don't care, it just doesn't matter. So um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go over sort of how Nomad works internally um, and also how it works operationally um, on the network. So this should look really familiar. This is simple, um, surprisingly simple. Um, it's a single region architecture. This is what Nomad look like, looks like. Uh, the reason this might look familiar to you is this is an identical uh, diagram with different colors as console. So operationally, it's identical. You have clients. They use RPC to go to a server. If a server is not a leader, they automatically forward to the leader for you. Um, and then there, you have replication going through Raft through all the servers. It's, it's identical to how console works. So in a lot of ways, if you already operate console, um, Nomad in a lot of ways will feel very familiar. It's different in a, in a few important ways, but in a lot of ways will feel very familiar. Um, one of the, the most important thing we took from this besides the tech was, from a user experience standpoint, was the request forwarding. 
The, I, it's really nice in console that you could just send a key value or send a request to anything, even a client. Like you could just send a request to anything, and it finds its way to the leader for you. Um, in the same way, you can nomad run a job file uh, on any nomad node, whether it's a client or a, or a server, and it'll find its way to the leader for you. Um, also in any data center, which our region we'll, we'll get to here. Um, so then the multi-region architecture, again, um, is identical <laughs> to console. So within each data center or within each region, um, you run a set of server clusters that are separate, and they communicate across the WAN with our gossip layer. Um, and in the same way, they forward. So you could, you could run a job for region B and region A, and it'll just send it over to region B for you. Um, and it all sort of works as you expect. Oh, actually, the super dense slides aren't, aren't here yet. So you, you can relax for a second. They're, I think they're coming, though. Um, so yeah, the, the, multi, the multi data center, multi region stuff in, in Nomad, the region is the isolation domain. So um, we don't support uh, like region level failures. Um, if, if, your, if your region goes down, then that whole region's down. Like there's no, we won't automatically migrate those jobs over to the other region. Um, if, if you define the job as running in both regions, then we figure it out. But for the most part, a region is where your full outages happen. Um, so in the same way that AWS does, if you run things in multiple availability zones, you're immune against a region outage. But if US East is down, then you're still pretty much in trouble. Um, it's, it's very, very similar. Within each region, you could have one-to-end data centers. Um, we call them data centers. AWS calls them availability zones. Um, it's fine. Uh, and then the, the rest doesn't really matter that much. So Nomad, uh, Nomad was initially designed f with these targets in mind. Like we, our 0.1 goal was to support these. And we didn't really get it right with 0.1, but we're, we're a lot better now. So. Um, our goal is thousands of regions, which might seem crazy, because if you think of how many AWS data centers are, there's like a few dozen. Um, why would we need thousands of regions? Um, we have very, very large users that were interested in Nomad that are CDNs. And for a CDN, every single pop is a region. So that might be a server at every university in the US, plus this, this person who uses a lot of bandwidth just in his house and over here in the, like, these three data centers that are a block away from each other. CDNs have a lot of things that, that go across the WAN, so the, each one is considered a, a region. So we needed th thousands of regions. Um, within each region, we need tens of thousands of clients. This, makes, this scale makes a little more, more sense. Um, you could very easily imagine uh, a region with multiple availability zones having 5,000 servers. Like That's sort of a reasonable number. Um, and then within each region, supporting thousands of jobs, which we've actually, this is the one that was a little bit low. Um, and Nomad now supports a lot more than thousands of jobs per region. But um, the idea that you could schedule not just thousands of applications, the reason why actually this number might seem high is you might not have thousands of applications, but Nomad's also uh, a, a way to queue jobs. So you'll see later it has a built-in cron mechanism. It has a built-in uh, mechanism for queuing one-off work. So um, for a lot of things, Nomad can replace things like RabbitMQ. It's not, a, it's not a queue replacement completely, but for a lot of tasks you might use it for, it does replace it. So um, we see production usage of Nomad for activation emails, for um, database cleanups, roll-ups, things like that. Um, no need to really use a queue for those. You could actually just send it to Nomad. And, and in that case, it needs to support quite a lot of jobs. OK, so here we get to the dense slides. So, we made this decision um, to be optimistically concurrent. And the only other publicly known scheduler that's optimistically concurrent is uh, Google's scheduler, current scheduler. That's not Kubernetes, their internal scheduler. Um, and there's no publicly available scheduler that you could buy or otherwise get that's optimistically concurrent. So um, Nomad's the first one. And, and it's, it's a really important decision, I feel like, because it's going to give us the scalability that, at a very theoretical level, no other scheduler will ever be able to achieve um, at a, at a, with some risk. So let's, let's go over what this means and why this is a really important point that you should care about. So this is where things are going to get a little real um, for a few slides. So the data model of a scheduler at its purest form is very simple. Um, you have an evaluation, which I'll define in a second. It leads to an allocation, and then the allocation runs, uh, or, yeah, runs somewhere. So an evaluation is basically a state change event. Um, anything, a, a new client comes online. A new client that can run jobs comes online. You update an existing job. You create a new job. You, re, you remove an old job. 
anything that changes the desired state causes what is called an evaluation, oh, which, is, which is here. And here we get to the part which is schedulers are basically a function. So schedulers are basically a function that turn evaluations into allocations. So for any time there's a state change in, in, in the desired state of the world, you get an evaluation, and it asks the scheduler to give it a set of allocation updates. Uh, and allocations are sort of what they sound like. It's given the state change of the world, uh, move this from here to here, stop this here, start this here. You know, it's a, it's a set of changes that actually need to be happening in the real world in order to get to that desired state. And, and at its purest form, that's what a scheduler is. So given it's a function, you could then specialize what that function does and how it behaves. So I gave you the example with the system jobs, um, which run on every machine. So given an evaluation, the allocation update is make sure that thing is still running on every machine. Um, there's also a few others. So there's service. Um, service says make sure it's running somewhere, but if it fails, re try and get it to start again. A service is meant to keep running uh, for a long time. That's, that's your web servers, that's your microservices, that's your load balancers, those are those things. Batch jobs are things that if they fail or if they ended and they quit, then they're done. They're jobs that are like send an activation email for this user. It runs, it exit codes zero, and you never schedule it again. Even though there is an evaluation change, which is this allocation ended, um, the scheduler gets it, sees it's a batch job, and then the result of that function is zero allocation updates. That job is complete. And OK. So here's the internals of Nomad and how it works. And then we'll get to the part where it's optimistically concurrent very shortly. So at the top, we have a bunch of state change updates. The desired state is happening. These create evaluation structures. Um, the evaluation structures are then all sent to the leader, which is the evaluate, evaluation broker. These are, this is all really cheap. All of this happens um, in, in microseconds, in very, very few microseconds. So this is all just happening really quickly. State change evaluation gets queued into a single leader. This is in the bottleneck of any scheduler. This is all, all of this will happen faster than any scheduling will ever happen. So this is never the bottleneck. Once it goes into the evaluation broker, this is where we get optimistic concurrency. So um, the, the opposite of optimistic concurrency is, is a, a pessimistic scheduler. And a pessimistic scheduler basically is a safe scheduler. So it, instead of seeing three things here with a pessimistic scheduler, you would see one, and it's probably the same machine as that broker. Um, a pessimistic scheduler says that given a set of state changes, we can only be sure that our real world changes are correct if we serialize the whole thing makes sense, right? Like if you do everything in order, you know that you didn't say start something when someone else had start something at the same time and then oversubscribe the machine when it shouldn't have been. So that you're pessimistic. You're saying that can't work, so I'm going to be pessimistic and be serial. And, and, and it goes through all these evaluations and creates allocations. An optimistically concurrent scheduler instead is optimistic where it says, ah, we probably won't mess this up. So let's just do it in parallel. <laughs> and so you run multiple. And, and this is why it's an architecturally very important thing, is because the throughput of an optimistically concurrent scheduler scales horizontally with the number of schedulers that are actually running. So to actually increase the throughput of the scheduler, you just increase this, this tier, um, which currently in, uh, in Nomad is, is threads or cores on a machine. Um, but yeah, you just increase that tier outwards. So these things are dequeuing, again, super cheap to dequeue. And then they go into the schedulers. The schedulers, that function that's actually trying to figure out the real world change, that's the expensive part. That's the part that goes from one microsecond to 10 microseconds, which is actually important. I mean, it's a 10x change in, in speed. You have to distribute this out. We're optimistic about it. But here's where optimistic concurrency becomes safe again. So once it, it, once it gets that, it, it creates what's called a plan. Um, a plan doesn't really need to happen in a pessimistic uh, uh, scheduler, but it happens here. And the plan is just the set of allocations that it would like you to do, um, but it's not telling anything to do it yet. This then gets enqueued again into a leader. Um, and again, this is super cheap. Compared to the relative to the actual schedulers, enqueuing these data structures that have no logic is really, really cheap. Um, so it's just going into a single, the, the, the same evaluation broker. It's going back with a bunch of plans. And then the plan queue then dequeues the plans and actually says, OK, did we mess up? Like you said to allocate here, is it now full? And if it's full, then what it actually does is sends it back up to the scheduler. It says, 
this, we messed up, there's a conflict, reschedule. And you know, in theory, that could happen infinitely, and your, your app might never schedule. Um, in practice, it, it doesn't happen infinitely, and, and we have sort of numbers to back that up, but, um, but it could slow it down. So in, in a worst case scenario, the, the pessimistic scheduler is faster because it'll never get a conflict. Um, and in the worst case scenario, the optimistic one is just constantly conflicting, so it's, it's not scheduling very fast. Um, but in practice, what Google decided was a good idea and what we decided to believe them with, um, but also you know, check it out, is that in practice, you very rarely get conflicts. Um, you only get conflicts under really stressful situations, like someone just submitted uh, a million job requests like at one time. That's probably going to get some conflicts. But on a normal day-to-day -day usage where you have a few thousand coming through a second with a, work, with a resource pool that's large enough, very rare that you'll get conflicts. So you actually get a lot more throughput. And I should mention that um, if you're sort of a database nerd, then the, the plan queue where, it, where it's applying things is really like applying the transaction. And you need to make sure that that transaction, you know, you maintain certain, certain uh, uh, constraints to make sure that transaction goes through. So in the same way, even though that's one machine, um, there's sort of well-researched uh, things out there of how to do multi-core transactions, how to distribute multi-threaded, how to distribute transactions across cores. Um, so we actually implement that research as well. So the plan queue is serial, but we're actually doing it in parallel across cores on a single machine to make it really, really fast. Uh, doing it across multiple machines is a whole new area of research, which is really sketchy right now. So um, we do it in one machine, but that at least lets you also scale the, the plan application uh, uh, machine if you had to by just adding more cores to it. And then finally, after all that's done, you have a set of allocations which are just sent to the clients. The clients are, are pretty dumb, and they just take it and they say, you said to start something, I'm going to start it. You said to stop this, so I'm not going to ask questions, I'm just going to stop it. Um, and they just do what you tell them to do, um, which on their own might lead to other evaluations, but might not. So in one slide, like if you wanted a picture or something, like in one slide, this is the whole internals of an optimistically concurrent scheduler. And it's it's all pretty simple, actually, when you think about it. <laughs> Lots of hairy edge cases, but at a high level, I think it's, under, it, you know, the fact you could explain it in a few slides in, in five minutes is, is a pretty good thing, I think. So the, the server architecture is, it's, it's an Omega class scheduler, which is, just means it's, it's modeled very closely to Google's Omega, which is, it's the only Omega class scheduler um, in public existence. Um, the logic is pluggable for the schedulers itself, so we could introduce others, and we in fact did in the last version. We introduced a, a new scheduler type called Periodic, and this is Cron, as Cron is a distributed service. Um, there's a bunch of internal coordination state, and we support multi-region, multi-data center um, out of the box. So you, you, don't need, you don't need a zookeeper, you don't need anything else. You just need console, it has everything in that one binary. That's the server architecture, and then from a client um, point of view, uh, there's broad OS support, so the clients work and run on, on every major OS. Um, we do host fingerprinting in order to detect what they're capable of, so if you, run, um, if you run a Nomad client on Windows, it probably won't detect Docker currently, and so any Docker jobs will never get scheduled by default to Windows. You don't need to do anything special for that, we just, it just happens. Um, and then there's pluggable drivers. And, and pluggable in the sense that we could, or like you could contribute drivers, not pluggable in the Terraform sense. You can't write your own driver and just make it available in Nomad without recompiling Nomad. Um, but pluggable in the sense that it's not, it's built in as an extension mechanism into Nomad. And, and in fact, plugins are coming to Nomad, so it's all, it's all coming. Uh, for the fingerprinting, these are sort of the type of things we look at. We fingerprint uh, the OS information. Uh, more importantly, we fingerprint hardware information, so we know how much memory you have, we know how many CPU cores. Um, we try to, this is the sketchiest part in general, like, there's no real good way to do it. We try to figure out the link speed of your network devices. Um, you know, OSs have a, have a way to tell you that link speed, but it's programmed by an operator, so it could lie. Um, so we try, we try to figure out the actual real world link speed of the, of the device. Um, we fingerprint applications, so we look for Java. If there's no Java, we'll never run Java jobs, Docker, console, that sort of thing. Um, and we also fingerprint the environment. So if you're AWS or GCE, we inject key value into, uh, into the metadata. Uh, so that's, a, we'll just skip these. Um, so yeah, that, that's the, 
uh, high level overview of, of Nomad from the, from the operational and scale side, you know, workload flex flexibility, scalability, uh, or schedulers, fingerprints, drivers, um, and the job spec. It's simple from an operator's point of view. Um, it's a single binary. There's zero dependencies, uh, zero required dependencies, um, and it is highly available out of the box. It, in the same way that console leader elects, if the, if the main server dies, you don't lose any jobs. You don't lose any allocations. It all, it all works out. Uh, and that's sort of it for Nomad. And then as a last couple slides, I just want to go over um, Nomad 0.3 just came out in January, so a while ago, but a, about a month ago. Um, and these are all the features of Nomad 0.3. Um, the new features were periodic jobs, job queuing. Uh, oh, the file system API I didn't talk about at all, but you're able to read the files out of jo uh, jobs that are running. Um, but this is everything that's supported currently in Nomad. So all this exists. And I didn't, I didn't actively talk about anything that doesn't exist, so you don't need to you don't need to like compare this to the rest of the talk. This is just this is sort of what I talked about. I even I left out one. Um, and then Nomad in the near future, um, what we're focusing on is log shipping. So just uh, being able to ship your standard out, standard error, or files that you specify um, to log collection mechanisms, syslog or what have you. Um, a plugin system is coming, so you're, so you're able to not just plug in drivers, but you're actually able to plug in uh, lifecycle hooks. So um, imagine things in this case like how do you register a Nomad job with the ELB or something like that. You want to be able to plug into the life cycle of a job. Uh, and then the, the most important thing I think, uh, maybe log shipping is more important, but uh, very close is volume support. So the idea of the first class notion of a, of a data volume and persistence. And uh, we have that all planned out in Nomad and, and sort of know how we're going to do it, but it'll have built-in support for, for knowing about things like EBS and the difference between EBS and something like console, which is more distributed and, and eventually consistent, and, and things just like memory or ephemeral. Uh, and so that's it. I don't need to go review this again, but that's pretty much it with Nomad. Um, and I think I have time for a few questions, so thank you. Do you have any plans for uh, a Lambda driver, an AWS Lambda driver? It's possible. Um, we're driven mostly by you know, what is immediately needed in, in the scheduler, and we don't have any real world users yet that need that, but it's, it's definitely possible, yeah. He has the mic, so I can't, I can't choose. Yeah, uh, you're talking about um, everything from like resource types and uh, uh, expected state and everything like that. If you add item potence, you've got basically the makings of an event-driven uh, configuration tool, configuration management system. Is sure. that something you don't want to cross the line over to, or are you going to? <laughs> That's a very <laughs> sneaky way to ask the question, if you're going to write a config management tool. Um, it's creative, I'll give you, but uh, I think, um, no, but I think that uh, <laughs> um, if, if, I always tell this to everyone, if you, if you want a HashiCorp configuration management tool, then we've, we've done 95% 95, 95 of the work you need in the core of Terraform. Um, so look at that rather than anything else. But we're not going to do it. So. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> hey, Mitchell. Hey. Um, so question. Obviously, I uh, saw kind of console came in for service discovery um, in 03. How would it work, though, if we wanted to kind of expose services kind of publicly? So if I wanted to take this home and use it today, I know Kubernetes has kind of cloud providers, so that would give you an ELB which would okay. map to a service. Yeah. That's a good question. That's actually one of the first, when you try to adopt a schedule, it's one of the first real world problems you run into, which is how to load balance something. Um, and there's no good answer. So on, on one side of the answer, you could wait for the pluggable thing so that we could hook an ELB or something for you. ELB is still not a great answer. ELB has limitations like every backend instance that must be running on the same port. So it requires you to statically assign every port in your jobs when really you want Nomad to do that for you and not have to have them be the same. Um, I'm more optimistic. It's just not, it's not a shorter term thing, but it already works pretty well. I'm more optimistic about things like there's a project called Fabio out of eBay. Um, Fabio is, is a cool project. And, and, and I think it's the future of how load balancing will work in general. Um, uh, across things like Nginx too, I'm hoping, crossing fingers, that like eventually someone there figures out that maybe this is a good idea. Um, but basically, instead of hard coding backend um, servers into or applications into 
uh, a load balancer. What Fabio does is actually does long pulling for console. So when, when a new job gets registered with console, it says, I have a new web service. It's running on port this, and they could be different ports. And Fabio picks that up using the long pull mechanism. So it's just as fast as like console template. It's like seconds. And it immediately starts serving that based on you know, host name matching, handles TLS for you. And, that. and I, the reason I think that's the future is because that's what Google does. Like if, you, if, you, if you look at Google and you, you dig um, gmail.com, google.com, um, any, any, any domain that Google owns, except probably like YouTube or some of the other acquisition properties, if you Google any of the main Google properties, they all point to the same IP address. There's, there's no notion of this is the, the google.com search load balancer, this is the Gmail load balancer. Google just has an, a huge edge global service load balancer. And it does host name matching and TLS there, and then forwards it on to the service, which is dynamically coming up and down with Omega. So I think that's where things need to head. Yeah. So today, wait for plugins or look at Fabio. I've, I've gotten Fabio to work great with Nomad, so it's super doable. Um, or, or just wait a little bit, yeah. Hi. Uh, what's your opinion on Nomad influencing the underlying uh, cloud architecture to ask for more compute? So, you know, as you said before, you know, you're trying to bin pack and, hey, I need some more instances. Start, some, start 10 yep. more. Or use the autoscale grouping functionality, for example. Yeah. Uh, autoscaling is going to come to Nomad, but we're probably going to charge you for it. So. <laughs> Hey, thanks, thanks for the talk, really good. Uh, so it's kind of related with the previous question about load balancers. How do you do the rolling update and uh, how does it integrate with the Elastic Load Balancer or whatever Google provides? Uh, the rolling up, I mean, it's, a, it's sort of the same answer. Like rolling updates are really dumb or simple in Nomad's case. Like it's just when to stop and when, when to stop the old thing, when to start the new thing. And we register it with service discovery right away. So if you're using something like Fabio, it sort of just becomes available right away. And Fabio actually has built in like weighted things to send traffic to like 5% of traffic to new or something like that. You could, you could do fancy things like that. Um, but otherwise, from Nomad's point of view, rolling updates are very simple. It's, it's, that's, it doesn't do anything to help you there. Any more questions at all? Not, not a sneaky question this time. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you collect a certain amount of uh, data about the servers. Is there a way to supplement that data with your own uh, configurations so you can create your own selectors and filters for execution? Uh, yeah, so that's sort of a con I think I think I understand your question. But um, with console, with the latest version of console, and they're getting even better, I, I think there's a release today. I don't know. Um, but um, there's prepared queries that allow you to sort of program logic into console's DNS lookups. Um, and that we're actually hooking that into Nomad directly, too. So you'll be able to actually make constraints and lo uh, routing logic based on various metadata around. So you know, prepared queries have existed since uh, September last year in console, or October last year in a console. But they're going to get more powerful. So if you find a use case that we don't support, make an issue, because we're still trying to figure out all the use cases for prepared queries. Final question, if there's one left. Oh, yep. That'll be the last one. Sorry, Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess this is a broad question. I think that the, the big name in the scheduler names, like, uh, is scheduler's word is Kubernetes now. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned few differences, but like how broadly you would compare Nomad to Kubernetes? I would claim that Kubernetes more and more is a platform and less of a scheduler. Um, even their scheduler interface is pluggable. So like in theory, I, I think it's kind of weird, but in theory, like Nomad could be the scheduler behind Kubernetes. I think on a, every day, I'm seeing Kubernetes move more and more to it actually trying to be an open source Heroku type thing, where they, like, out of the, like a scheduler as a concept is pretty well defined. It's the, it's the work to resources sort of thing. But if you look at Kubernetes, it does that. It, it, it includes a scheduler, but it also gives you um, configuration built in, uh, secret management built in. It gives you load balancing to some extent built in. So these are really f and logs, uh, log tailing and log shipping built in. And we have to do that to some extent, because logs do have to get out of a scheduler somehow. But if you look at it, it's, Kubernetes is a lot more like Heroku and a lot less like a cluster scheduler. Um, and maybe that's what you want, but we're still figuring out the right balance. So Nomad currently is pretty purely a cluster scheduler with a few nice-to-haves that you just kind of need to run in production. 
Um, but for example, for configuration, we don't do anything automatically for you, but what we recommend is you, you could create a job file with two tasks, one's console template and one's the job. And, and one thing I didn't mention, but two tasks in the same group in a job file share data. Um, so you could actually write, console template could write the config for the other application. Like we don't, it's not free. You don't get that for free, but you, uh, free in the sense that we don't automatically give you configuration, but you could easily just do it. Um, and, and it's more explicit that way. And so we're still watching and trying to figure out what the right balance is between that. And what do people need to get into production? Um, and what is too much or something like that? And, and I'm not saying Kubernetes is. I'm just not sure yet. So I would say the, the other scheduler the, that's definitely a scheduler is Mesos. Um, but I, in, in practice, I, I see it more as a Hadoop scheduler more than a generic application scheduler. Thanks so much, Mitchell. Thank, Thank you, you once again. Thank you. <laughs>